What's going on, family? I am Pastor Joel, the lead pastor of Core Church Atlanta, and I am so excited that you have chosen to join our YouTube channel today. If you haven't yet, make sure that you like, subscribe, and share, and I truly pray that the message today blesses you. Hey, uh, I'm going to be continuing this morning in y'all series, Pastor Joel. Uh, told me that you guys were in a series about who told you that. and uh, He asked me if I'd be willing to talk about who told you that. Uh, you needed to live in shame when there's grace for you. Right? And so I was like, well, man, that's, that's awesome. I think I got a message I could pull out and talk about that. And then I went and sat down in the coffee shop and the Lord wasn't going to let me recycle, wash, repeat, and recycle a message. And so... I got something that's kind of fresh. I've never preached this before, so if I do a bad job, blame Pastor Joel. I don't know, you know. Um, But I titled this message, Change the Playlist, and here's why. One of the things I've noticed about playlists, I I got Spotify, y'all might have Apple Music, but you create a playlist, and in that playlist, you get to name it. And I'm real creative with my playlist. I got playlist, my playlist one. I got my playlist two. I got my playlist three. But my favorite playlist, I've got five. It's number five. That's my favorite. It's just not too long ago I learned you can actually name a playlist. Bless my little heart. But, uh, and so here's what I've noticed, though. The, the music that we listen to, and it's been proven psychologically, the, the, the music that plays in our heads impacts our heart. And what impacts our heart will ultimately impact our mood and our emotions and what we do with our lives. And so, so often the playlist that's playing in our heart and mind is not one of grace, it's one of shame. And so the music and the melody that's echoing in our minds and in our hearts has us tied up the things that Jesus died to free us from. And so I want to talk to you about how you can change the playlist today. You can choose which playlist you're going to listen to. And so hopefully if I do a pretty good job, if I do a halfway decent job, you guys are going to leave here freer than you came. You're going to leave some stuff here. not going to take it home with you. Some of you walked in with some baggage. You've walked in with what your dad said about you. You walked in with what your friends did to you. You walked in when someone got that promotion that you deserved and they overlooked you. You walking in with what's wrong with me? Why didn't I get it? Shame has a lot of different ways of manifesting itself, but the reality is, is there's grace for you, and all you got to do is step into it. Y'all ready? All right, we're gonna step into it today. Here you go. So here's the thing about shame: the only way you defeat shame is with an overwhelming dose of grace. It's the only way to defeat shame is to have. An overwhelming dose of grace. And I'm going to show you from the very beginning, from the very beginning of time, shame has been an issue. Shame has been an issue. In fact, the interaction between God and Adam and Eve in the garden proves it. Let me read you this. This is Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. This is what it says. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. How many of you know that if y'all heard God walking outside that you'd probably run to him? Right? I might make a hole in the wall. Like, I'm, I'm go- like, I am so- like, we love God. He's done so much for us. We want to get to him, but that ain't what they do. Because that's what shame does. Shame gets you to run away from him instead of run to him. Check this out. Listen to this. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. Do you see that? You see what shame did? So they, they had eaten of the fruit. They know that what they've done, they're naked now, who, you know, and all this stuff. And so check this out. So they hide from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man. God's response to our shame will always be his voice. Always. He will, he'll always call to you when you're hiding from him. And so check this out. Listen to this. And he says, where are you? God didn't ask that question because he wasn't sure where they were. (laughs) He knew. He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. You ever felt like that? 
You ever just felt like God sometimes gets too close? You like God meddling around in your business, don't you? <laughs> it's my faith. I'm going to meddle with you today. Just hang on. And this is God's question. He said, who told you that? Who told you that? Who told you that you were naked? So right there, that tells us something. There was two voices, at least two voices in the garden, but I think there was three. There's God's voice. There's Adam's voice. And then there's Eve's voice. So you got God's voice, Adam's internal voice, internal voice, and then you got Eve's external voice. So you really, when it comes to shame, there's only three voices that can be listened to. Only three. And so God asked him, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? God didn't ask that question because he didn't know that they had eaten from the tree. He asked that question to provide them an opportunity to receive grace. So here's what tends to happen with us. We think God's coming to us and asking us this question because God's out to get us. Because we've learned that God is just this angry, big, holy, righteous deity in the sky that we should hide from. But God asks you a question not to shame you, but to set you free. But Adam listened to the voice of shame. He listened to the voice of Shame. So I want to talk to you about the three voices that are in the garden and that I believe that are also in the garden of your life. And, and based off of these voices, I think if you can identify which one you're listening to, there will be freedom by listening to the right one. So what I mean by that is this. If you're listening to the wrong playlist, you're never going to experience freedom. And so if the voice is a playlist that impacts our emotions and can set us free or bind us up in shame, we got to make sure we hit play on the right one. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Adam missed the opportunity to hit play on the right one. And we actually, we see this pattern all through Scripture. Cain and Abel, same pattern. David, same pattern. We see it constantly. So here's the three voices that really you need to be aware of. The first one is the outside voices. There's outside voices in your life, and these voices are, are the world's expectation of you. How many times have you not lived up to someone else's expectations? Oh, come on. Oh, come on. You got mama and daddy issues. Can I say it that way? Come on. Is that all right? You got, you got mama issues. You got daddy issues. You got, like, at some point, your issues are no longer the issues of who did it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say it, Pastor? Come on. Sometimes your issues are your issues. At some point, you can't keep blaming people for the shame you're living in. Sometimes the outside voices influence us, but they don't bind us. You can be influenced by the wrong playlist, but you, you listen to some death metal or some crazy music, and you go murder somebody, and you end up in court. Well, I was listening to some music. It really set me off. <laughs> It's silly when I say it that way, right? But what people have said to you and the expectations of the world and our culture. Let me give you one that's real. You ready? Come on. Well, you don't love me if you don't accept me the way I am. Yeah. Yeah. Stay right there. And then what happens is if you don't actually accept them the way they are and actually give them the stamp of approval, guess what's going to happen? Yeah. They're going to shame you for not loving. Mm -hmm. that's so good. Oh, I said what I said. Yeah. And so here's the thing, with the pressure from outside voices to conform will ultimately lead to us being bound up in shame, not living in freedom. You cannot listen to outside voices and live for the Lord. Wow, wow. At least not live freely. At last I checked, I want to live free. Last I checked, I don't want to live under the rock of shame because I found that rock is pretty heavy. And so if you're going to live free, you've got to understand that the only way to have that level of freedom is to crawl out from under the rock of cultural expectations. Be different. Be different. You know what I love? I love different. Yeah, I love different. I love going to a different restaurant. 
I'm pretty particular about what I eat, but I love going to a new place. I love new places. I like new shoes. I like new things. I like new things. And so here's the reality. Another really good example of shame is the mental health crisis that we have. Right? We've been talking about mental health now for years. Like the church used to be really bad about not talking about it. Now we're talking about it. But you know what? There's still a stigma attached to it. Oh, let me help you with this. I bet, and don't raise your hand, I bet if we were to ask people how many people in this room actually need medication, oh yeah, I'm about to get real, need medication to help you with your mental health, most of us be like, I ain't raising my hand because I don't want anybody to know. You know what that is? Embarrassment that you need medication. Shame. It's shame repackaged. And so we have to project this image of happiness and strength and productivity. Otherwise, otherwise, we're not measuring up. Listen, pastors have this same problem. Can I just get real for a minute? Well, if my church ain't as big as their church, I must not be as good as them. Cultural expectations of what things are meant to be looked like. Because we live in a world where the trend is to project this curated, flawless, perfect image of our life where there is never anything wrong. But you know what that is? That is shame repackaged. Oh, they won't love me if they know this about me. They won't accept me if they know this about me. Can I just tell you, people accepting the version of you that you present is not true acceptance. And the reason you don't feel loved and appreciated and accepted is because you're asking somebody to to love and appreciate a form of you that is not really you. That outside voice will cause you to hesitate to reveal your true struggles. Look, you probably do this with your pastor. Can I? This is the good thing about I get to leave. Y'all can email him. I don't know what the email is. Pastor Joel at Corcher. I don't know. Actually, email heaven. It's Jesus at heaven.com. Just email him. He's throwing it all out. But here's the reality of it. A lot of times you'll come to, to, to your pastor to seek spiritual advice, but you'll only give him half the information because you're afraid of how he might look at you. Well, well, pastor, I, I, I struggle with, with relationships. But you won't tell him that you slept with the dude the night before. And so you want him to give you relationship advice, but you got a lust issue. Good Lord, I said what I said. But here's why you got a lust issue. Because culturally, the world tells you that saving yourself for marriage ain't cool. And you're more worried about what your friends think, whether you haven't said, um, okay, I'll move on. I'll move on. I'll just keep, I'll keep going. I'll keep going. Internal struggles that remain hidden will never experience freedom. What's not in the light cannot come to life. What's not in the light cannot come to life. Bring it out and just see if they love you. If they don't love you, that's on them. That's on them. Listen, you're going to either love me or hate me, but you're going to get me. That's it. Now, I ain't saying go be free with everybody. because You don't want to be loose-lipped, lace, and mm-mm, don't be telling everybody everything. I don't know what lace is. I just realized I said lace, too. He's old. They said I was old. I feel so much pressure. So you got the outside voice, right? Y'all got the outside voice. Number two, number two, you got the inside voice. Now the inside voice is as powerful as the outside voice. It's equally as disruptive to our lives. And the inside voice is really our thoughts, our, our insecurities, our past mistakes and our past failures. It's the, it's the internal dialogue that often echoes our shame the loudest. And so the playlist that's running in our head might not be outside. It might be uh, how we didn't keep our promise or how we did that thing that we said we weren't going to do and we kept doing it and kept asking God for freedom from it and then did it again. And so we start saying it's insecurities because you made a mistake last time. You see what I'm saying? And so what? let me, let me tell you what this sounds like. I'm going to read it. it. It sounds better when I read it. I always make mistakes. I can't do anything right. 
Everyone else seems to have it all together. I'm just a failure. I must be inherently flawed because no matter how hard I try, I never measure up. Why can't I just be like everybody else? I must be a burden to the people around me. They've probably noticed how incapable I am. Maybe if I hide my struggles, people won't see me as a failure. I should be better, but it feels like I'm just stuck in this cycle of disappointment. See that internal voice playing games in your head? And so what happens is the battleground of our mind and heart becomes a place of self-criticism and a determining factor in whether we're worthy or not. Shame wants to convince you of, that your worth is not what God says it is. And so then we start to listen to that inside voice and it causes us to live a reserved, safe life instead of a free life where we're making a kingdom difference. All because you aren't really dealing with shame. Shame will convince you you're not enough. Shame will convince you you're not enough. Shame will convince you you're not enough. The third voice. This is my favorite. It's my favorite voice. It's the one of the one calling out in the garden. The one who asks the hard questions. It's the, the voice of God or the voice of Jesus. And so this other voice, this in, in this arena, the way I see this is it's in this arena where there's all these there's the external voices and the internal voices, and then you got the voice of God and, and they're at war with each other. They're they're fighting it out like gladiators, they're battling it out in your heart and in your mind. And the thing about this voice of Jesus is it's actually the most mighty of all the voices. It's the voice that causes the heavens to thunder. It's the voice that creates nothing, uh, something out of nothing. It's the voice that calls you to salvation. It's the voice that we really should be listening to. It's the voice that stands above them all. But it seems like it's an unfair fight, doesn't it? I mean, you got two voices against one voice. You got two strong, powerful voices of shame against one voice of freedom. But I can tell you this no matter how loud the external gets, no matter how crushing the internal feels, the voice of Jesus will always triumph. The voice of Jesus will always triumph triumph. And I'm going to tell you how I know his voice leads to victory. The only playlist that needs to be playing in your mind and your heart is the voice of the kings. That's right. That's right. Any other voice, just shut it off. Just change the playlist. Delete the playlist. Rename it to stupid and don't listen to it. <laughs> However you need to do it, just make sure the right list is playing. John 16, 33, this is what it says. He says, I have listened to what he says. I have told you. Remember we talked about who told you that. Jesus said, I am telling you this so that you don't have to live in shame. And listen to what he goes on. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You know what shame does? It disrupts peace. You may have Peace, because in this world, those external voices, they're going to cause you trouble. But take heart, those internal voices are subject to Him. I have overcome the world. you know what He's saying? My voice wins. What I say wins. How I say it is how it goes. Jesus is, listen, what you're fighting so hard, Jesus has already defeated what you're fighting, that voice in your head, that cultural expect, those parental expectations that you aren't living up to, all those things, every one of those that you fight against that wake you up at night, that keep you downtrodden and just broken up, those things, Jesus has already won. He's already defeated. Listen, he says, I have overcome the world. You're an overcomer. Overcomers don't hide. Overcomers don't hide. I got no reason to hide. You want to know my story? Come talk to me. I'll tell you. It's, I, it's messy. It ain't pretty. I mean, I'm pretty, but the story ain't. I'm real pretty. Them lights shining off my head, I'm telling you right now. Y'all can think that's the lights, but I'm going to call it the glory. Woo! 
<laughs> but here's the reality of it. Today you're going to be forced with this reality. You can either choose to still be captive to what you're thinking, or you can choose to take the thing captive that has held you captive. There comes a point in the Christian's life where you reach the maturity level to where you have to make the decision that when God says that to take every thought captive, then God must empower me with the ability to actually control the playlist. And so if we, we must take captive what has held us captive for so long. You don't have to leave bound up in shame. Actually, you can leave free from shame and become God's mouthpiece so others can become free from shame. Shame. Shame's played the wrong melody in your heart long enough. It has. And it's bad. It's bad. Like y'all got a good worship team. They, they, they sing, they sang, they sung. It was good. It was good. I almost turned my mic on to sing with them. And then Pastor Joel wouldn't have a church. Listen to what Paul tells the church at Corinthians. This is what he says, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. It says, we demolish arguments and every pretense... Every, not some, not, did he say some? He didn't. And so here's what happens. Shame will come knocking and it'll knock, 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 knock with his lying lips on the door of your heart. And here's what Paul is saying. Every single time it knocks and you open the door, that shame gets blown up by the grace of God. So pretense is what it literally means. Every thought Every philosophy, every perspective, you know what that is? Everything, every other voice other than God's gets just absolutely destroyed when it sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And then listen to what he says. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient with Christ. You thought it was going to be easy. Shame is not easy. You have to force it to submit to keep. To the king. Wow, I like that. You gotta force it. So here you pray the prayer. I'm so glad you prayed the prayer. Guess what's gonna happen in the morning? You're gonna hear that same voice again. Guess what's gonna happen next week when you pray to buy it again? The same old outside pressures are gonna show up again. But what happens is, is God steps into you and he says, Hey, guess what? I've given you the strength, I've given you the power. Change the playlist. Change the play. You don't have to listen to that. You can actually force those thoughts to submit to what God says. You can make them submit to what God says. And I want to give you an example. I'm going to give you a biblical example that I think will help you understand how this plays out in our lives. Y'all remember Sarah and Abraham? Yeah. Poor old Abraham. You got to feel bad for Abraham. His wife was difficult. <laughs> My wife is not. She's wonderful. So I'm going to kind of summarize this story for you because there's a, there's a lot to it. You can go read the whole thing. It's Genesis 12 all the way to chapter 21. I'd encourage you to read it, actually. In Genesis 12, this is what it says. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Here's what's critical. Abraham was 75 years old. Say 75. 75 years old. 75. He's old. When he set out from Haran. So what's happening here is in Genesis 12, God makes Abraham a promise. He promises Abraham's going to make, he's going to be the father of many nations and you know, you know all this stuff. G generations and generations. And, and so God makes Abraham and Sarah a promise that a great nation would come from them. The problem is Sarah is barren. She can't have babies. So how's a great nation going to come from me if I can't have children? It's a valid question. It, it's logical. And so fast forward to Genesis 16, and what happens in Genesis 16 is it tells us that Sarah decided to take matters into her own hands. So she's like, hey, Abraham, 
I've got a servant. Name's Hagar. Why don't you sleep with her and fulfill the promise that God gave us? And so what happens is when we, like Sarah, feel barren and incomplete or inadequate, shame finds a foothold in our hearts. So here's, see, what's happened is in Genesis 12, God makes Sarah a promise. The problem is, is in Sarah has to live with the cultural norms of her day. You know what the cultural norms of her day? Women had no value if they couldn't bear, bear children. Yeah. Her, her worth was tied to her womb. And so what happens is, is Sarah then begins to get crafty with figuring out how she can take responsibility for fulfilling the promise God had given her. And so what's crazy about this is these external pressures, the shame she felt from not being able to bear children, caused her to compromise and have her husband sleep with another man. You know what shame does? It convinces you to compromise because you want to feel better. But can I just tell you, when you compromise with shame, you're not going to feel better. You're going to amplify the problem. And so check this out. Listen, I'm going to listen. Sarah had wrongly attached her worth to her womb because the society that she lived in created false expectations for her. What Sarah failed to understand, and I can, can't y'all hear it, can't y'all hear it though? Like, I can almost hear Sarah looking around and, you know, her friends are having babies. And, and, then, and then somebody walks by, you know, they're standing over in the corner. Hey, there's Sarah. God promised that she would be able to have babies, but she hasn't yet. You know, the snickering in the corner. You know what I'm talking about, right? So, so she's seeing all that. And then, then, you know, it's late at night. Abraham's asleep. She's laying in the bed. God, why? Why would you promise me something that's not possible? So she's got the external and the internal going on. And so the, the voices that she's listening to aren't from chapter 12. They're from the snickers in the corner. They're from the thoughts in her head at night. And so what tends to happen in our life is those shame playlists will begin to play in our hearts instead of the voice and the promise that God had made. And here's what's wild. It was never Sarah's job to deliver on the promise. It was never her job to figure out, God, i got to figure this out for you because you made a promise that hadn't happened yet, so let me do something about it. And so what happens in our life is we will go, God promised that I could have grace instead of shame, and then suddenly what we do is we start being a good little Christian thinking that we're going to have no more shame. Wow. Or we start medicating ourselves with things that aren't healthy for us, Right? Man, listen, when you're hurting on the inside, that beverage looks real good, doesn't it? When you're hurting on the inside, that substance looks real good, doesn't it? When you're hurting on the inside, sex with that girl is going to make me feel a little bit better, doesn't it? Oh, I'm, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> listen, I've been there, I've done that. You ain't going to fool me. And so what happens is what we begin to do is we begin to substitute an artificial promise for the real thing. Come on, come on. And so shame, shame will have you convinced that the artificial is sufficient for your freedom. Wow, wow. And so in chapter 17, in chapter 17, something crazy happened. Abraham is still with Hagar, she's doing, you know, that whole thing. And, Got another son. It's a mess. It just turns into a mess. And listen, women crazy, y'all. <laughs> yeah. Listen, husbands, your, your wife comes to you and like, you should go sleep with her. That's a trap. <laughs> you fall on your knees. You grab that woman's hands. Baby, you're the only woman for me. My eyes are for you all night. I ain't never even looked at another woman. Never. It's just you. You're the most beautiful woman on the planet. I'm telling you, it's a trap. Listen to this in Genesis 17. When Abraham was 99 years old, say 99. 99. 
So we started, he was how old? 75. He's 99. That's 24 years. That, that's a long time. The Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Huh. And then he goes on. And here's the thing. Some of y'all been waiting for God to deliver on his promise for a long time. Maybe you're at year 99. Maybe you're at year 78. Maybe you're at year 83. I don't know where you're at. In tw 24 years is a long time to wait for God to deliver something. That's right, that's right. 24 years. Tw imagine 24 years of laying in your bed. Wondering when God's going to come through. And then, I don't know how many years have passed between, you know, the whole Ishmael, sleep with Hagar mess, but you got years of thinking about that now. Oh, the, now the snickering went from, oh, God can't deliver on His promises. To, can you believe she did that? And so there's 24 years of regrets, 24 years of just rogue thoughts, 24 years of I wish I hadn't, 24 years of struggle, 24 years of questions, 24 years of doubt, 24 years of societal pressure, 24 years of internal voices, 24 years of listening to the same playlist over and over and over again. 24 years. 24 years. How long's your shame playlist been playing? How long how long you been listening to the, the wrong voice? Seriously. How how long? How long ago did the play button get pressed for the shame that you feel today? Genesis 18. The Lord appears to Abraham, and this is what he says. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. What Abraham didn't realize was Sarah was over there kind of, you know, being sneaky and just listening. What's this about? She hears this, and what she does is she laughs on the inside. She mocks the promise. It's a dangerous place when shame gets us to the level of laughing at the promise that God is giving us. It's a dangerous place. Because here's what shame wants you to do. Shame wants you to mock the promise that God has given you. Shame wants you to doubt the promise that God is going to deliver and so what tends to happen for, for a lot of us is that her, you know what her laughter really is? If you study the original language, you know what her laughter is? It's skepticism. Yeah. Yeah. Well, today, so for her, it was like, yeah, right. But you know what? Listen to me. I want everybody to look me right in the eyes. You can be shame free today. That's right. I bet half of you was like, well, maybe. Because you've prayed that prayer, right? You've asked God to do that, right? And so what, what happens is the promise of God begins to experience skepticism just because of the past. You know what that sounds like to me? Sounds like Adam hiding in the garden. Sounds like Adam hiding in the garden. But I think God's asking you the same question he asked Adam. Who told you that? Who, who, who told you that? Genesis 21. Worship team, wherever you guys are, y'all can come on. Genesis 21, verse 1. Check this out. I love God. Probably a good thing. I love God's response to Sarah's mockery. Listen to this. You know what happens? About a year later, she gives birth. Check this out. Sarah doubted. Sarah listened to the wrong voice. Internal, external. 24 years of listening to the wrong voices. 
So it doesn't matter how long you've been listening to it. Listen to God. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah. As he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Can I just, listen. Oh man, I hope I can, I hope I can help you see this. God will do what God said He will do. Yep. Yeah. 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 That's it right there. He will do it. Yeah. And it's not even contingent mm-hmm. upon whether you believe it or not. All God wants to know is that when He calls out, when you say, I'm over here, I'm over here. See, I'm crazy enough to believe that God's walking around in the room and I'm crazy enough and got enough faith to believe that some of y'all, God is speaking to your heart and He's saying, I've been looking for you but you've been hiding behind shame for so long but there you really are. And He's just wondering, will, will you respond to my call? Because what I have personally found in my life is that I want to remove the shame so I can come clean to Him. But Jesus didn't die so that I could clean myself up. Jesus died to clean me up. And so I get to come to Him with all that 24 years of baggage, with all those doubts, with all those regrets, with all that shame, with all that fear, with all the dumb decisions that I've made. I get to walk right into the presence of Jesus and go, I've made a lot of dumb mistakes and I'm really embarrassed that I did it, but I know you love me and I know that you will deliver to me grace and that you will exchange my shame for grace. Do you not realize that Jesus didn't just die for your sin? He died so that you could be free from the shame of your sin. So why are we still? And I say we, because listen, I still got a bad playlist too. Why are we still letting the wrong melody play in our heads and our hearts? I think it's time to change the music. I think it's time to change the music. And I want to just point one more thing out to you, and I'm going to give you some stuff. I'm going to rapid fire some stuff. In chapter 12 of Genesis, God delivered a promise. He delivered a promise. In chapter 21, after a whole bunch of issues and a whole bunch of problems, God kept His promise. Can I just tell you that the promise of God will always precede the problems you face? I'm going to prove it to you. Before the foundation of the world, He was the lamb that was slain. Before sin was ever a problem, God had a promise to deal with it. Listen. Oh, dear God, I want you to get this. I know it's hard. It's hard, y'all. Three years is hard, Joel. It's hard. Do you realize most church plants don't make it to three? Statistically, they don't make it. God delivered a promise before He made any of the problems come to the surface. Sometimes you don't have the reality to hold on to. Sometimes all you got is the promise. And it was delivered to you in the beginning so that you would have something to hold on to until it's delivered. Get it? So what are some of the promises that God has already delivered to you? Y'all ready? This is going to be fun. Y'all stand up. I'm going to go fast. I'm going to go fast and they go do their thing. Y'all, y'all ready to do y'all's thing? All right, good. Because I'm going to go fast. That's a lie. I'm a preacher. Put these songs in your playlist. You ready? Here's the songs you need to put in your playlist. Forgiveness and cleansing. 
1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Your sin doesn't have to be your story. Forgiveness can be. You are forgiven and you, listen, you might have came in dirty, but you ain't got to leave dirty. You take you a bath today. Take a bath in the grace of God. You can be free. Put that song in your playlist. Number two, I am not condemned. I know the world might condemn me. Heck, even church people might try to condemn me. But I am not condemned. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If I'm in Jesus, I ain't condemned. You can't condemn me. Pick up your stones and throw them. They don't hurt me. I am not condemned. Put that song in your playlist. I'm clothed. Oh, I like this one, Joe. Because see, the reason I like this one is because y'all don't know how dirty I was. I'm clothed in righteousness. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God for He has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of His righteousness. I was once unclean, but baby, I got a royal robe on now because of grace. Put that in your playlist. God's unfailing love. His love does not fail me. Zephaniah 3.17 The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. you. What? He'll take delight in you. See? Even the sound system's confused. I don't know what just happened, but I like that. Listen, some of y'all almost was like, yeah! That happened, didn't it? See, I told you I was dirty, but I'm clean. He will take great delight in you. In His love, He will no longer rebuke you. but He will rejoice over you with singing. Put that on your playlist. I'm not who I used to be. Shame will convince you to be who you used to be. Grace will tell you that's not who I am anymore. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new has come. We ain't waiting on it. It ain't going to show up later. It's it's here. It's right now. The old is gone. The new is here. Put that on your playlist. And the last one. The promise of restoration. Joel 2.25, it says this, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. 24 years of the locust eating away at Sarah's mentality. Eating away at her acceptance in her community. 